Hello and welcome. I railroaded Doc Coleman into joining me again. This time we're talking about character creation. This is part three of my Preptober live streams. Usually I do my Preptober for NaNoWriMo during my lunch break, but you know, here we are. And this way you get to join in and have fun with me. So week one was outlining for planters and that was a pretty quick one it took what 45 minutes because planters don't outline that in depth or at least this one doesn't uh last week was world building and doc coleman and i finally took a break after three hours uh because we, we were getting a, tired we quit after three hours <laughs> <laughs> we were getting tired we didn't run out of things to say about world building there's a whole world out there yep. okay and big. Um, i cracked myself up so but this week we are back with character creation now obviously you do not have to do your preptober or preparing for any novel in this order i could have totally done it in the opposite order or jumbled it all up and all of the parts are so intertwined and so interconnected that changing one thing will change another. And so there's no one way, one right way to do this. I just picked an order and went with it because I had to do pick something. There, so, there, there's one right way. It's your right way. And you have to figure out what that is on your own. <laughs> and the right way for one book doesn't mean necessarily it'll be the right way for the next book. True. So just because you found, you've learned how to write a book, You've learned how to write that one book, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I mean, you're the same person, but your context changes and your story changes. You're writing a different story. And so your method may change. Yeah. And as you, as you become a better writer, theoretically, your method will change. Mm -hmm. um, and but. processes exist to help you accomplish something. If it's not helping you accomplish what you're trying to do, change the process. Mm -hmm. Try something else. Feel free to experiment. Exactly. Hello, CV. And well. <laughs> so uh, my, my vague outline for this discussion is first I'm going to talk about names and the importance of naming characters. Then I'm going to talk about who I need for my particular story. Um, and then I'm going to come up with my go-to name list. Um, and I'm going to talk about types of characters and that sort of thing. And then I'm gonna do some Google image searches cause I'm not a very visual person and I like to be able to see who I'm describing. Um, how do you create your characters, Doc? Um, my characters tend to, to, to come from different places. Um, like <coughs> when, uh, um, when I started off with a uh, uh, crackle and bang in the Perils of Prague <laughs> right uh, placement, um, <laughs> that that started with a Halloween costume. Um, I I I dressed up as a mad scientist, and my wife dressed up as as the beautiful assistant uh, in the, the the shapely gown, and we had had goggles on, and she passed me her goggles at some point during the party. And I was wearing a top hat and I didn't want to just stick him in my pocket. So I had space. I wrapped them on the top of the top hat. And then I looked at that and I said, somewhere there's a character in there about a person who always wears two pairs of goggles on their top hat. I mean, and, you know, that's where the seed was, was planted. Um, part of it goes back to, um, Cause some of it, part of it goes back to Excalibur comics, um, where you have uh, uh, Captain Britain, and they they did a, a run back there where they did some multi universe adventures, and one of the universes they gave you a, a <laughs> hello cat that they gave you a peek into was was one where everything was very was still very Victorian and steampunk, and part of that is where I got the idea of, okay, we're going to have that and we're going to have Queen Victoria as an eternal figure. Um, and 
I've pulled things from different places. Um, the airship in Perils of Prague is inspired by Up. Oh, oh fun. Super fun. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like the the inspiration is is all over the place. Um, right. uh, um, Miss Bangs started off as being uh, uh, the beautiful assistant, and then the joke was everyone thinks she's an idiot, but she's the smartest person in the room, always. Um, so. Things kind of evolve from there. It, it all all starts I, to make a long story short. It all starts with a seed, and then you see where it grows from there. Um, right, right. Obviously, uh, the my my narrator started off as a nothing. He was he was just the the audience's view into that world. Mm -hmm. And over the revisions, he he gained a life of his own. That he didn't need to just be the audience's eyes, but he needed to have a purpose and an opinion. And um, he, he had a background that he grew out of where he felt pushed around from his family. Mm -hmm. um, so he became, you know, he was out there supposedly uh, uh, seeing the world and looking for a wife, whether he wants one or not. Um, but in the end, he ended up looking for a family. So. Oh, I I've love stories on. that are about found families. Found family stories are great. Mm -hmm. So uh, when when you're creating a character, some people start with the concept, some people start with the name, and some people start with an image. It all mm -hmm. depends on what sort of person you are. So let me let me just grab my notebook so I can get started yeah. here. Um, so and I just gave you an example. I started with an image. Okay. And right. I started with an image, and the next thing came the name, and then several elements came together and built the concept. Um, and you know, the the image was was the the professor with the the two sets of goggles and the be the beautiful woman next to him. Mm -hmm. um, and the names were were Crackle and Bang. <laughs> uh, so I wanted it to be the adventures of Crackle and Bang, so I had to make it you know adventurous mayhem. Um, and then bringing in the steampunk elements and the, the the different places they come from in the world filled in the concept. Right. Okay. So uh, for those of you just tuning in, for NaNoWriMo, I am doing a fantasy set in space with um, my inspiration kind of drawn on from the fable Colony of Cats and maybe some Baba Yaga in there as well. So I want my story to be rich in mythology, um, myths that actually exist on Earth, and also a new mythology made out in the stars because I'm set on another planet and I'm going to have octopus people. Um, so thinking about octopus people, they have beaks and underwater, what kind of sound is going to travel best? Vowels and clicks or taps. So the octopus names are going to be maybe something with a lot of vowels and some ticks and then, you know, a nickname that the humans are going to use. Um, and my main character is human, not an octopus person. So, so, so that's, that's my vague concept. And my, my main character is uh, started off on a family ship. The ship broke down. Mom and dad contracted out for seven years their time, um, 21 years travel time because of distances and speeds. Um, so, so we get that sort of fey, they're in the other world and missing time and peeking back kind of feel to it. So, so first, I mean, I'm gonna have to name the world, but we're talking about character creation. So who is my main character and what sort of character is she? Well, going off the the traditional fairy tales and stuff, um, or taking my inspiration from there, I'm, I've decided that her name is Velissa. With a V. With a V. With a V, okay. Yes. Um, uh, oh, I might... 
Wait, nope. I, I'm trying to remember the name of the girl with the doll that she leaves in the Baba Yaga stories. Uh, Basil Basilissa, the beautiful. Basil. There we go. So, so that's who who my inspiration for my main character is coming from. Okay, so you're so, starting with a very old world name, right? So typically in the past, when I've created characters, I've been trying to get away from a particular culture because when you name a character, it comes with all the cultural context around it. If you choose a Greek name, if you choose a Roman name, if you choose um, a Celtic name or a British name or a French name, it's going to come with all of that cultural baggage, especially since so often um, I write fantasy so I'm not setting my stuff in the real world. And when you use a name from a particular culture, it comes with those expectations because very often fantasy is done almost as an alternate history version or mm -hmm. what if this has happened instead? And therefore, when you use a set of names from a particular culture, you're bringing in all of those cultural expectations that go with it. So. I find naming characters very, very, very hard because I want to be very careful about what sort of context I'm bringing in around my characters. Um, yeah, and I, I can see that being very important when you're doing a, a fae fantasy or if you're doing any kind of story dealing with, with uh, uh, gods, um, or I guess you could lump them together as yeah, anything you're doing dealing with greater powers because they put a lot of stock in the naming of names. Yes. Um, oh, so yeah. you, you either have to live up to the name or break the name. Right, exactly. <clears throat> so, um, and names have connotation and names have a cultural meaning. So when you take a name from another culture that you're not uh, familiar with, I've heard it... Uh, suggested that you want to take perhaps go to a newspaper from that culture and pick one of the smaller names not in the big story so you don't want to accidentally grab their charlie brown or you know something like that a very famous name that you might not know out of context and also you don't want to mix um first name and last names because you might not recognize what looks like a first name or a last name and you might give them two first names when that's not appropriate or you might mix, um, if there's within a culture, multiple um, either class mm -hmm. or religion, there may be names that are associated with either a particular class or a particular religion, and you don't want to mix and match those. So that can be something to watch out for. Dinner's here. Be back in a second. Sure. Okay. Another thing you want to think about is sometimes I like to take real names in real life as inspiration and then change a vowel or a consonant or a couple of them. But no matter what you do, when you come up for a name for a character or a country or whatever, Google it and make sure it's not a word with context that you don't expect in another language. So, so definitely do your research. You don't want to end up with something that means no go in another language for a car or something like that. Although I've heard that's a myth, but still. So, so for this story, I seem, because I am taking from Russian fairy tales, I think I'm more comfortable using Russian inspired names than I have been in my previous uh, stories. So, I am going to use Basilissa, or maybe a variant of it. I'm not positive yet, but let me go ahead and write it down. Basilissa. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and mute Doc. I just heard him open a soda. It sounds delicious. <laughs> Actually, I just I just unmuted myself to to add. If you're oh, going awesome. to use, if you're going to use names from a culture not your own. Right. This is a reason to have a, a, a sensitivity reader from that culture. Definitely. And try not to get too wed to the name in case you have to change it. 
Exactly. Uh, one of the other common things they tell us about naming characters is you don't want to have too many characters in your story whose names start off the same way with the same letter or the same couple of letters. If you do have five characters with R names, try to vary the length. Um, I understand some families have names and stuff like that, etc. Um, Kevin in our audience asks if there are any fears of cultural appropriation. 100% there are fears of cultural appropriation. That's why you want to age your research and be reach out and get a sensitivity reader to make sure that you are not um, overstepping your bounds. Um, and Kevin also suggests that in middle grade and YA, cultural appropriation is a very sensitive topic right now, which is 100%. And for good reason, because the people who are making stories or money on the stories tend not to be the people from that culture. And that is problematic. Uh, a lot of times people say that they just didn't relate to the character because it came from a different culture and that's not their culture. And they need to really step back and see if it's the story that's the problem or if if it's their own innate cultural expectations. So definitely something to be aware of. So, okay, I am, I, I have a character, I have a main character. So let's think a little bit about who she is and what she wants, because your characters need goals and they need, you know, they didn't pop in here out of nowhere. So Vasilisa, is, let's see, I think this is going to be an adult book. So I'm going to make her 22. No, no, she's about to go to school. Um, hmm. But let's, let's go ahead and make her 19. I'm going to make her 19 because she's going to school, but she hasn't been able to get in, ad, um, into pilot school yet. She, so a little backstory, uh, her family used to live on a, an interstellar ship. Uh, they had their own little one and it broke down or there was a family issue, maybe a health issue. And um, they got grounded on the planet where the octopus people are. So she wants to get back in the sky. That is her big thing, to get back in the sky and get her family back together. Those are her primary motivations. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that down. Motivation, fly um, and get family back together. Which is more important? Getting uh, the family together or getting flying again? Um, I think she really wants to get off planet because okay. she feels like she's wasting away, but the urgency to get the family back together and, you know, not betray them and, you know, get back to where they were is, is definitely a strong motivator. Cause you're talking about a character who is basically stuck in a place in their life yes. and their main drive is moving forward. And this is how they see that they can go forward. Exactly. So uh, that's a good motivation for a primary character. Right. It's an agency. <clears throat> definitely. Definitely. Um, I, I have written char main characters without agency um, who just react, but you can go back and just because your draft has no agency doesn't mean you can't go back and change it and make them more of a uh, proactive character. And I've got a story with a character who basically gets pushed around by events because she was happy where she was before. She wants to get back there, but back there isn't really a real place anymore. And she really gets pushed around until she gets ticked off that she starts uh, taking control of her own life. And that's where things get interesting. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people out there who are exactly like that. So let's let's talk about what stands in her way. Hello, we have an Eva. Um, things that stand in Vasilisa's way. Money. She doesn't have the money to go to pilot school. She doesn't have the money to get off planet. 
Um, she doesn't have the money to get the family ship working again and everybody back together. So she's she's really motivated by money will solve a lot of her issues, like most of us. Once you have enough money for, you know, the things you need and maybe a few of your ones, you're probably OK. But until you get there, it's it's a little rough. It's a little rough. So so that is her biggest impediment. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is that her family is tied into contracts. Um, I'm not sure if anybody was on my previous ones. So her family, uh, her parents have signed on to a corporate mining company. Um, it just made sense to me since we're in space uh, to fly their ships for them. And uh, they they have a seven year flight contract or a three year, which which makes more sense. A three year contract that is 21 years on the planet or a seven year contract that's 21 years. I, I like the three and the sevens because that's very fey. That's very fairy tale number. Um, I'd, I'd go with a seven year. Okay. <laughs> um, and honestly, the logic behind that is typically you'd have a five year transportation contract. Right. Um, so rather than going shorter, they, especially if the, if the parents had a good reputation, mm -hmm. the company would want to go longer right. in order to, to uh, uh, have their services. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, that gets in the whole corporate mindset, but. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay. So, so those are the two big things counting against her. So now let's talk about character attributes. Um, one of the most fun workshops I have ever attended was on character building. And in, in this workshop, we all wrote down three attributes of our character, and then we dropped them in a hat. And then we drew three random characters. Why? Because when you're thinking of a character, typically there's sets of attributes that we give to different people that are expected and stereotypical or tropey. And even if we're trying not to, it can very easily fall into that habit. So. Obviously, I was unable to do this by myself. Um, oh, Joe Walton, that's who ran the workshop. Okay. So she is an amazing award winning winning writer. So I just want to give her some shout out. I um, did a writer's, writer's round table with her once. That was very fun. Uh, isn't she amazing? Mm -hmm. She's She's a really compelling speaker and very knowledgeable and writes good stuff. So um, one of the ways I duplicated this sort of thing on my own was I took a pad of paper and I wrote three lists and I numbered them. And then I just had a couple, dice. I had some dice and I rolled them and it would randomly select three attributes for me. So that way I didn't fall into those stereotypes. I didn't um, necessarily say, oh, he's the strong, silent type who's very you know protective and stuff like that or they're a barista they're clearly snarky underpaid and highly caffeinated and can't spell no uh. <laughs> and enjoy talk art yeah so um there, there are certain tropes and expectations that we have of even background characters and by doing this sort of um attribute generation you can really help vary up your your secondary and your background characters because I'm pretty sure your main characters are relatively clear in your head. Some of you out there, I'm sure, are the type of people who see these characters in your head like a movie and they your your imagination has already done all the work for you in real movie time. That's not how it works for me, unfortunately. I'm I'm a very conceptual imagination. I know what they should look like, but I don't see it in my head. I know what type of person they are, but I still have to change it from a mental idea, a mental flavor into words. And and that's a very good exercise because 
people, real people have many different facets and there are some they show you and there's some they keep hidden and they don't necessarily jive well with each other. Some are like, you know, no, he's he's a geek and a gamer and captain of the football team. It's like, what? Uh, no, you know, that's against stereotype, but real people are like that. Yeah. In, um, in my hometown, um, the our our quarterback was VP of the National Honor Honor Society. His girlfriend was the head of it, and he went to college and studied religion, and he's now in the family business of funeral homes. Yeah. So these are not things that a default person thinking of a quarterback at a small school would really map together. And so by by adding in a randomization factor almost, you can really help be like, oh, but what if? Now, obviously, when you're picking these random adjectives from a hat, if you really can't see a way for it to work or it doesn't work for this character, it's your story. Throw it away and try again. Um, hello, yeah. Del. I hope you're having a lovely break from editing. I know the editing doldrums can get long and tedious. I've I've been there. Yeah, I, I know that that is a great technique for adding a little bit of character, a little bit of of personality to background characters, mm -hmm. or just branching off of of your own characters and giving them a little bit more depth. Right. Um, that that isn't necessarily plot driven. Yeah. Now, I know there are plenty of people who, when they're doing character creation, really enjoy just making an entire character sheet for them in the role-playing sort of history fashion um, with all of their strengths and all of their skills. And sometimes that gets a, I, I get close to that, but it's a little more in-depth than I usually do, at least outside of my head. Obviously, I like to say that all of my ideas and concepts just kind of percolate in the back of my head. Not that I drink coffee, but you know, I understand how percolation works. I, I was a barista and I was not caffeinated. <laughs> so- A little um, mental fermentation. <laughs> so, so let me think about my main character here. What are her main personality traits? She's going to be determined. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's me and also because of who I've based her on, I think she's going to be sweet and thoughtful because in, in the story, Vasilisa and the beautiful, that's what she is. She's very thoughtful and considerate and she follows Baba Yaga's rules. So, and, and there's, I like there's a character trait right characters. there. I like writing sweet, sarcastic characters. I don't like writing mean or harsh or it. Um, my stories are not self insert by any means. However, when you're writing a main character, very often, most of us find some aspect of ourselves that we can channel. While it's not a self insert or our true selves or anything like that, we can identify with the character through the shared trait. And that can help add a level of authenticity to the character because you want your character to feel authentic and well-rounded and three-dimensional and all of those things. Um, But I think she's also gonna be a little impulsive. Okay. I could see her. She, she's she's sweet. She's determined. She she plays by the rules. She needs some character traits to get her in trouble. Sometimes following the rules can get you in trouble if people have conflicting rules. Yeah, um, following the rules is supposed to keep you out of trouble, but it also makes it easy for other people to set you up for trouble. Exactly. So that's a good conflict angle. Mm -hmm. but you need to have both internal and external conflict. Right. So someone can mess with her using that trait. And, and, but you, you still need ways that she gets herself in trouble. Right. And, Obviously impulsive goes a long way towards that, I think. And let's see. Um, maybe she, she holds a grudge. <sighs> 
I don't know. I'm not um, sure on that one. Okay, so so we we've, we've she's a little impulsive. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, grudges are good. Um. I'm just trying to think. Is there anything? Is there anything that's appropriate that's kind of out of left field? Um. um just because I I I I always like the things that that seem a little bizarre. Just because, uh, um, it ends up with some great, great reactions with with other traits and great interactions with other characters, and okay, it, I have just googled character flaws, and here's a list of 123 ideas. There we go. You want to just pick a random number, or should I just go through and see what we get? Seventy six. Seventy six. Let's pop down here. Seventy six is. Over emotional. I'm not feeling it. Not feeling it. No. Um, thirty-two. Thirty-two is fickle, erratic, changeable, and unstable, especially with affections or attachments. I don't know that you're going to have a she lot. She could be of very much into the new shiny. Now that's that's. That's a boss. That's something you can work with. Um, ooh, and that's actually kind of a nice. We've given her a very well. You've given her a very traditional name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take ownership of all someone else's characters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've given her a very traditional name, which which indicates that her parents are, are traditionalists. Mm -hmm. But she's driven to move forward in her life. So if she has a fascination for things that are new and different, that's in some ways that's going to help her living on an alien world, trying to, to work her way in, but it's also going to lead her into places she shouldn't be and doesn't know that she shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. that's, so that's a good one. And, and it goes well with the mm -hmm. impulsive. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Kevin in the comments says that he had an editor recommend Deborah Dixon's goal motivation conflict template for character development that keeps the story moving. And he's found it very helpful. So I'm, I'm trying to follow something definitely similar. I started mm -hmm. with her motivations, which is to get off the planet and get the family back together. And then what stands in her way? Money and her parents are stuck in a contract. And so... Um, let's see. Um, okay. So, so that's the vague idea of what this character is. Okay. So, uh, next thing I normally do is I start looking for characters that look right. I like to go to Google image search and look around. Mm -hmm. So, oh, hello, DL. Um, but this time I, I actually played with a character creator. Um, someone linked, oh, where so is So is it important for you to know what the characters physically look like before you start to write them? Not before I start to write them, no. But mm -hmm. um, I, I find it fun to add to a Pinterest board just for, to put, have all my visuals in one place, mm -hmm. which I, I find very, very helpful. And um, I can definitely see having having some of the details figured out before you start to write definitely makes it useful so that you're not going along on the fly and it's like this week her eyes are green, next week her eyes are blue. <laughs> right. Right. So um I I played around with a character creator I found online. Let me see if I can find the same one. Uh, yeah, I know there's there's one delightful tool that apparently uh, uh, generates photorealistic images of oh wow that don't exist. Oh, um, I've seen that. It's creepy. Yeah, it, it is. It is both creepy and glorious in several ways. Um, I've seen pictures that people have pulled off of it. I've never actually gone to it. Otherwise, I'd, I'd have it bookmarked somewhere. But. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> so let me just look at last week's search history. 
Maybe it was the week before. This might be a little scrolling. Um, let me go ahead and do a screen share actually. So, and show you my results and I'll pop the link in later. So I, I've decided that the octopus people on this planet are greens and purples and that there is a difference between the deep ones and the shallow mm -hmm. tropical octopus people. So maybe people who live on this planet like to dye their hair. Okay. So, and I, I, I gave her some burns on her face. Like maybe she was damaged when the family ship broke. So she's a little bit punk. She's, um, since she does end up going to the octopus um, pilot school, maybe she does the heavy braids to mimic the octopus strands. So uh, it was hot. That's kind of interesting in, you know, how, how do the octopus see those strands? Right, like, right. Um, she looks kind of really depressed. In this she, she's not thrilled. She's yeah. really tired and she hates this planet. Um, mm -hmm. She like, I think she gets along fine with the octopus people. Um, one of the things I found when I was researching octopus people was, or octopus, octopuses, octopi, octopi. Um, was that um, typically in the ocean when creatures give birth or, you know, lay eggs, they let it go in the water and roll off and on with their lives. Octopi do not. Once they have sex the first time, they never eat again. And the mother stays with the eggs until they hatch and then gives up the ghost and like dies of starvation because it's been a month or in one case, 52 months since they last ate mm -hmm. while they were guarding their eggs. So... I, I would see them as being very maternal character creatures that, you know, care about their young and their offspring. Um, should they, you know, evolve into a species that keeps eating after their first encounter with the opposite sex? So um, I, I see them as maybe a matriarchal society um, because the mothers are the ones that stay with the mm -hmm. eggs and the, the guys currently just, you know, go and mourn for that perfect one encounter until they're dead. Um, well, their, their biological urges have been satisfied. They have will, propagated their species. Except you've, you've changed it so that instead of just leaving, the, mm -hmm. the males continue to take care of, of the mothers so that they survive. Right, right. So um, is it the father that's feeding them or the mothers of the mothers of the, you know? That 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 has some interesting uh, uh, ripple effects. And it's like, do the mothers basically stay in one place wherever it was that they, they laid their first brood? And if, and, and, and the males feed them from then on. Right. And then... You know that then there's a possibility that they could continue to have children, right? They exactly. Could continue to build upon that brood, but the mothers would never leave again. Um, or that, I I would imagine their homes would be something like um a stone walled in area that doesn't let a lot of predators in. Mm -hmm. Um, where the tide you know can wash in and out somewhat, but only to a minor degree. And so they're younger in this safe little pod, but they can go out in and out as as they want. Um, and th they're still octopuses. Um, you right. know, not all of the young are gonna survive, but mm -hmm. the clever ones will, the smart ones will, and they they will and I I have them vaguely amphibious because I want them to be air breathers as well. So once the young have developed their lungs and joined sentient society, they're, mm -hmm. they're given a name. But, okay. They're not actually octopuses. I can hand wave as much as I want. I, I'm, 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 I'm coming up with, with interesting ideas and I'm trying very hard not to drag us back into world building because there's some fun things with, with, with this octopus culture 
where you know the places of power are where the the mothers are. Right. Oh yes, <laughs> I can definitely see that. Um, so I've I've played with that in other stories where you are born and where you will die are where your power is most focused. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know where you will die. Because nobody does, hopefully. Yeah. Unless you're on your way out, I guess. But you, you do have to kind of play with this culture in order to build the <laughs> octopus the octopod characters. Um because you yes. you've you've got to have a, a whole class of them and they've got to be different. And they've I got do. to have different I attitudes. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So I, I do need to know more about my octopuses before I can name them. Before, so I know who they are. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's talk about one of my octopus characters. Um, there's going to be the introductory to piloting um, instructor. And they're going to need a name with a bunch of vowels and a nickname that the humans give them. So, wow. No, that's a bad name. Hmm. Sorry. Um, what you were talking about before about sounds being uh, um, uh, uh, the generated underwater that that travel well enough to be understood being built around beat clicks and uh, um God, God, yeah. I, I keep thinking about whale song exactly uh, because that's what travels through through water that's what mm -hmm. um conveys the easiest and so I, I don't know that octopuses actually make noise in this world but in my fantasy world, they totally can, but consonants aren't going to travel that well in water. In in some ways, this is a lot like okay, um, yeah, what what is the Wookiee's name in his real language? Oh, Harold. Exactly, uh, you know, something like that. Um, because that's that's the kind of uh, uh, vibrations you're going to be able to make. Throw in finger snaps for for right. Uh, uh, for beat clicks, uh, if you're uh, a human trying to pronounce it, or a tongue click. Mm -hmm. So depending I'm thinking, on how skilled you are. Right, right. I. Yeah. Sure. Might as well be the first character's name. So, um, humans call them Mister Io. Um. There are two different philosophies to take on assigning nicknames to, to alien species. Actually, okay. there's three different philosophies. Mm -hmm. One is you try to pick a nickname, which is the human's best approximation of saying that name. Right. The second is you let the alien creatures determine what human word they like. Oh, yeah. That that they want to have used to to address them, um, and and the third is kind of like you know, uh, uh, pilot nicknames. They're they're attributed according to behavior, which usually means they commemorate some bad mistake you've made in the past. <laughs> right, right. I I feel that's a very human thing to do, mm -hmm. and so my octopus are not going to have that sort of nickname. Um, right. That doesn't stop the uh, humans from doing it, but the the octopus Puss people are not. So, um, and I think their title is going to be pilot and not sir or miss or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm going for the human approximation. Okay. So, and you, you can also have a little bit of both. You can always have, you can always have a, 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 an alien that says, you know, some of you may be tempted to call me such and such, but instead it for you call me so and so. So I don't know that they can speak each other's language. One oh. so I, I think they can understand each other. I don't mm -hmm. know that they have the tongue to speak each other's fluently. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, so 
I, I would say that both sides are approximating each other's names and therefore they're not seeing it as offensive. Mm -hmm. So it just, part of it is how, how much are you going to, are you going to, how easy do you want to make it for your readers when they're reading along and uh, uh, reading about, you know, pilot IO and professor Wu we, and, you know, uh, right. uh, engineer Google, Google, uh, well, versus, you see the name and you know you're talking about an octopus person. This is true. Um, but you could just as easily have, you know, Pilot Jaeger and uh, uh, Professor McGonagall and <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Engineer Scotty. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's your story. It's your choice. But there's different as aspects of how you want to deal with it. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, definitely something for me to think about. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure I have an answer yet. So thank you for bringing up those points. I really appreciate them. So let, let's talk about this pilot um, instructor. What sort of personality are they? They um, Their goals are to train people. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you've got to look at why are they a pilot and why are they an instructor? Right, right. Um, so, and and what is what is the philosophy of piloting for for this race? Right. So for those of uh, you who are just tuning in, uh, for my octopus spacefaring people, they pilot genetically engineered jellyfish. I've determined jellyfish. Okay. Um, or whales. I don't know. Maybe they can see through the eyes. No, nope, maybe, maybe it's something unique to their planet that is that right. is similar has similarities to both. Right, a a, a jelly whale. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our our main character is human, and she wants to learn to pilot, and she wants to get off this planet. And the only way to learn uh, or get a pilot's license with a human ship is right now, since she has no money to either get a scholarship, which she did not get, or to contract herself to a corporation for the seven years in pilot time, 21 years in real life. And her parents have forbidden her from doing this since they already did it and it stinks. Um, so, so we have, have this, uh, She's stuck on the planet until her parents get back and they have another 15 years. Yeah, it's, it's, the other aspect is that as, as a young adult, uh, despite living on a ship, she's got no, no skills while her parents at least had marketable piloting skills. She uh, has a little bit of everything, but not so much that she qualifies yeah, for anything. Yeah, not, not enough that she qualifies for any of the better births, so... It would be, it's bad enough as it is for them. It's that would that, that much worse for her. Exactly. Exactly. So um, let's, let's talk about pilot IO. Pilot IO wants to train people. And I think pilot IO is taking a um, turn training because they currently have a brood that's growing up and they want to be on planet until the young ones are old enough to go off planet. Okay, so uh, uh, so Io has Io has a mate on planet, but they they generally live off planet. As a pilot, you'd be off planet, right? Right, obviously. Um, but, um, or or you or you'd be surface to space pilot, uh, right? Yeah. So which which is a totally different pilot, um, but. Mm -hmm. For the humans, it's a totally different type of pilot. Do these spacefaring jelly whales land on planet anymore, or have they evolved to live in the ether space? That's that's an interesting question, and that's going to be answered by how you decide that they actually get into space. I think that the first ones would have launched from the ocean. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's part of their evolution cycle now. I think just like the um, just like the octopus um, have their water only period and then amphibian style, you know, mm -hmm. now they have some lungs as well and they can do both. 
I believe that um, they, I, I believe that the jelly whales start off in the water and then go to the air and then go to space as they get bigger. So I think learning to pilot in a surf, an air to mm -hmm. space air would to space. be the first step before you learn to sail the ether itself. Mm -hmm. So, so the jelly whales are going to evolve as well. Um, Luke in the comments has said entry level pilot position available, 10 years experience required, no pay, no benefits apply today. Yeah. They, oh, there is healthcare though. They, they do. Yeah. <laughs> they do healthcare and meals, room and board. So, so that's definitely a thing. Okay. So we have why the pilot is there training and, um, the pilot's worries. What does the pilot want? What's holding them back? Well, the kids are young. Kids are too say, young. The, the, the pilot wants to fly because that's why you right. become a pilot is so you can fly. Right. And, and what's holding them back is, is their family. Because, right. I mean, we've just established that the mothers don't tend to move once they, uh, 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 once, once, once they have children, and if unless the mother gets pregnant on a ship, she's staying where she is. <laughs> right, she's staying where she is until those babies are in the air. Mm -hmm. um, so, hello, we have a Chandra. Thank you for joining. So, right now, we're talking about my octopus fantasy people who are interstellar pilots on bio ships that are actually je jellyfish whale things. Um, so I have a name for my character. I have, um, so, so I think that's the main things we need to know about the pilot. So let's, let's talk about Vasilis's family. Okay. She's got her dad who is on the ship far away. She's got her mom who's on the ship far away. She has her aunt and her cousin who are near her age. And, and I think her uncle, how many people do you think would be, how many adults should it take to pilot an interstellar ship, even a family one? Are we talking a crew of five? Are we talking a crew of seven, 12, 20? That, that depends on the size of the ship. Right. If you're obviously. talking a huge bulk freighter, you're going to have a large crew. If you're talking about a courier that's sending, that's bringing uh, information and and high high value goods, you know that could be a handful of people. Um, How did her family ship make its living beforehand? Specialty foods. I was going to say if if it's a if it's a family ship, then they're probably doing a lot of courier. It's probably a small ship. They do a lot of courier runs. They specialize in. And information and uh, low mass, high value good, high right. value good with specialty foods and spices and things and couriers, luxury items, luxury items. So, so yeah, probably about the size of the Firefly. Uh, for the mm -hmm. human ships, um, there may be some robots, uh, but for the um, octopus ships, it's all organics. So right now I have octopus space people and mm -hmm. I have humans. Um, there should probably be another space race, but I haven't decided what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, my boyfriend always suggests iguanas, but they like to nap too much. Interesting. So how big is the human presence on this, this octopod planet? Um... I'd say it's near the ports. I think they have about three main ports mm -hmm. that are not water-based. So it's 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 basically a, a, a trading enclave. They've it's a got, trading enclave. Yes, they've got they've got a a, a, a human compatible port. They've got services for humans. Right. They've got a bunch of trading things set up. Mm -hmm. You know, people buying are. loads of fish to go off planet. Right. When you're an aqua-based um, species, there's a lot of things that you can't make because, you know, hammering, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. 
So, okay. Uh, we need a captain. I'm going to say mom was the captain or grandma. And grandma died and everything fell apart. Because she yeah. had some debts we didn't know about. That's entirely possible. <laughs> So grandma is dead and had some debts we didn't know about. And that's when the whole ship home fell apart. Um, we need a navigator. I'm going to say dad was the navigator. And mom was the pilot. Um, let's engineer. see. Engineer. Engineer. Uh, aunt or uncle or both? Uh, you could you could have have both of them be different kinds of engineers. Okay. Uh, uh, one could be in charge of life support and the other one could be in charge of vengeance. Uh, how, much of a, how much of a specialty that is. Right. Uh, so we're going to have aunt be in charge of engines and uncle be in charge of everything else. So, okay. So for the bio ships, mm -hmm. we're going to have a captain, a navigator, a pilot, and um, a caretaker. Um, since they're bio, maybe the captain can be the navigator as well. <clears throat> or the pilot is also the navigator. That's an interesting, it really depends on, on what it's like to, to pilot one of those ships. Are you, are you giving instructions to, uh, uh to the, the ship or are you in some way melding with the ship so that you're seeing with the ship sensors and, and and moving it like it was moving your own arms and legs. Um, there's there's a number of different ways you can go. Yeah, yeah. Um, also depends on the the size of the ship, right. the size of the ship that you're going to be flying, um, because if if. If these are going to be starfaring creatures, right, uh, setting up new new colonies elsewhere, they're going to need some really big ships for moving lots of material. Right, but <clears throat> I, I think I think. Oh, okay, okay. Going back to what I think I thought of before is right. you've got your captain and you've got your pilot and you've got your co-pilot. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the caretaker. So for the bio ships, we've got the captain slash navigator, um, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the caretaker. The pilot is is mentally bonded with the jelly whale ship, <laughs> but right. the co-pilot can help steer it during off hours and monitor things and stuff. But right. once you have become a pilot for a bio ship, you you are its pilot. And as it grows, it turns into a colony ship eventually. But until it gets that big, right. it's not going to. And, and we, we kind of talked some last week about how the, the ships become families of their own. And right. you have to be acceptable to the ship in order to join the crew. Exactly. Um, I wanted to point out something that, that Luke uh, uh, brought up in the chat about uh, uh, talking about having doctors, weapons officers, security administrators, all, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, just because of how dangerous, how dangerous is your, your space faring world? Do you have the dangers of space travel? Do you have dangers from other races? Right. Um, Definitely. You know, is it necessary to have weapons on the ship or is space just so freaking big that the odds of you encountering anybody are, are, are next to none? That's a good and, one. And thank you, Luke, for having the good taste of buying Perils of Prague and, and having it on your shelf. I hope you read it, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you haven't, my to-read pile is three years deep. I totally understand. Um, and hello, Charlotte. Thank you for joining us. So um, 
For those tuning in late, I am talking about my fantasy world in which um, uh, it's a sci-fi fantasy and I have octopus people who are spacefaring and they use jelly whale ships, uh, jellyfish slash whale ships um, to travel around in and our main character is trying to get a pilot's license on a jelly ship because um, to get one on a human ship requires selling 21 years of her life to the corporation, which doesn't have a name yet, which I definitely need to do. Uh, so so I, I just went over what sort of positions I need on the ship. So, so let's go back to building her family. She's gonna okay. need a dad, a mom. Yeah. She's staying with her aunts and her uncle and her cousin on planet. And I think they're running kind of a bar diner sort of thing. Okay. Um, so just one one note. Why is it why is it so inexpensive for humans to get into the Octopod Academy and learn about ah, all these things? It's not. It's part of a um it's it's part of an exchange program, so there's a couple scholarships available. Okay, so they're basically having to compete. They they get to go for a while to compete to get in, mm -hmm. and if they get in, you know, as long as they keep doing it, they're they're in. But if if not, then they got to find somewhere else to work. Okay, exactly, exactly. And and while you can be things other than a pilot and trained up on a ship, um, only one or two people humans from each year even make it to the pilot level. Right. So this, so this is a cultural exchange program, but it's also a great opportunity for any humans living on one of these planets because it is so much more affordable if right. you could do the work. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. If you have enough money, you can go to pilot school. She does not have money. And yeah. so, um, it, the the main corporation that will pay for you to train and learn and go through school and that sort of thing is uh, a big, large mining corporation that is local to this region. And mm -hmm. that's who her parents um, have signed off to with the hope of raising enough money to fix their family ship. Their family ship currently is a draw on the resources because you have to pay to maintain it. And um, in my world, human ships don't land on the planet. You take a shuttle up to them and um, they uh, kind of need a tow out of system. And then they um, sail the the ether of outer space between the galaxies. But once you get into the galaxies, the ether or the water is kind of choppy because of all the uh, close proximity with astral space um, objects celestial objects there we go <laughs> okay so, um so the the corporation is a little big brotherish but it's it's not really it's just a corporation out past you know yeah, the, the corporation is the corporation they're looking out for themselves right. if they do a good deal for you fine if they do a bad deal for you as long as they get what they want they're good with it right um, and apparently because of this, with this sweetheart deal in here for for this cultural exchange, that means that the octopods are sitting on something that the humans want, which may be something as simple as the technology for doing biological ships. Um, but the humans definitely want to be in favor with the octopods and keep trading with them. So that's, that's, that's more background, but it also impacts... Uh, um, it definitely impacts the attitudes of the people on the planet and both races that you're going to encounter. Right. <clears throat> so um, welcome, M.M. Ward. I'm glad your power is back and you're here. Uh, Chandra says some more East India Trading Company. Yes, exactly. We're, we're not really within the confounds of a necessarily federation or country or what have you at this point. <laughs> A um, young East India Trading Company before they started bringing their own armies and wielding ridiculous amounts of power. Right. <laughs> so, so in my search for a names of her family, um, what I like to do is I like to go to baby name sites and see if it can, uh, since I'm using real names for once, instead of coming up with things off of the top of my head, one mm -hmm. of the things I really, really like to do before I get into NaNoWriMo season 
is I like to compile a list of at least 20 names, probably 30 names that culturally and um, logistically fit without being too similar. As we talked about earlier, you don't want names that sound too much alike or you will confuse your readers. Um, so, so I like to compile a list of names. So when I run across a secondary or tertiary character I hadn't even thought of, I can just grab and go. Because um, one year I did NaNoWriMo and uh, people are like, oh yeah, just use placeholder names. So I have a story with Alice, Bob, Carol, Dave, and all like the first most American generic default name possible. I went through the alphabet and then started going through it again. And the neighboring country was named Canada, so I didn't have to stop and think. I did manage 75,000 words, but I haven't touched that manuscript since. Since A, it's a hot mess, and B, it is the sequel to my YIA fantasy that I'm actively querying right now, and there's no need to rewrite it until I know the final shape of the book that comes before it. Yeah. That's actually a very, very nice technique to go and have a, a, a list of preloaded names. Um, I have, I have did, did not do that for, for Perils of Prague or for, for Kindred of Kali. Uh, I relied on the fact that Scrivener has a name generator in it and has uh, um, names based on uh, uh, certain locations, which when I was trying to come up with names for... English people was not a problem. It gave me all kinds of good name suggestions. When I was trying to come up with the name for the inspector in Prague, they didn't have a single Czech name. I had to go do research. Oh, no. I got into Kindred of Kali and had to come up with all of these Indian names and hybrid British and Indian names. Oh. It, it didn't have a damn thing for me. So I, during... During the 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 first uh, uh, shot with Nano, I was dropping placeholders left, right, and center, trying to keep them consistent across all the different characters I had to track, and then I had to go and find and find Indian name sites and try to figure out, you know, right. do I want something common? Do I want something literal that says something about this character? Yeah. Or do, do I just want to grab a, a first name and a, a last name and hope I didn't just make up something obscene? Right. <laughs> right. M.M. Ward says uh, she spends so much time on names and naming conventions for her series. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Some people aren't picky or are very intuitive with names. I am not one of those people. And so it's something I really struggle with. And if I wait until NaNoWriMo to come up with the names, I will lose my entire writing time trying to come up with the right name for the person. Yep. So um, Chandra agrees it's same. It's so hard for fantasy for them. Uh, let, we're gonna take a two minute break right now to go grab some water and whatever, and we'll be right back.
And we're back. Yeah, I wanted to to point out one thing. Um, I couldn't find a reference for it during the break, but Howard Taylor um, of Schlock Mercenary had a, 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 a species in his, his cartoon that were basically giant balloons. And all of their names were somehow wind-based. Oh, and wow. he actually came up with a formula where he figured they all had 10-syllable names. So he was able to, whenever he needed a new name, he could generate one on the fly, and it meant something specific. Um, he's talked about it a couple times in uh, um, in the Writing Excuses podcast. And I, I tried looking real fast, but I couldn't find anything like that but if you have the prep time to do something like that for your alien race that's fantastic um otherwise you know you can always just put in numbers for it and then go back and figure out uh the name system later <laughs> but i wanted to mention that just because we're talking about the naming of names and he did such a great job with that <clears throat> Definitely, definitely. Thank you for for mentioning that. I that's one of the few web comics I haven't followed. Although I did read it at one point. Um, so uh, MM Ward wanted to let us remind us that names are like lasagnas. They have all of the layers. There's the visuals and the audible sounds they make, and the cultural baggage they come from, and the class they come from, and the period they come from. Some names feel like they came from, you know the twenties and whatever. So um, DL says he tries to come up with all the names for the characters that I know I'm going to need at some point for my series before writing any of it. Yeah. And that, that sounds. Uh, uh, sorry? This, this is character creation for planters, not planners, not plotters. No. <laughs> plotters. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, most planters will will just cover the main characters, and we tend to throw up incidental and backup characters with no notice whatsoever. <laughs> We're like, "Oh, yeah, there's a soldier. Maybe the do we even hear the name? Do we need the name? Definitely, I do consider if I need the name. Background yeah. characters that are used once, see if you can get away without using a name. Sometimes it's way too much effort than it's worth to avoid naming them. But if you don't have to name characters that aren't going to come back, don't. Yeah. Um, so Doc said, yes, replied, what I just said. <laughs> you want to say what you want to say? Um, I, I, I literally just said that. <laughs> I oh, okay. read off my own tweet. Um, but yeah. it's, the, the other thing that we do is that, We'll, we'll create a, th a throwaway character. We figure, oh, because of the relationship, they have to address this person by name. I have to give them a name. Mm -hmm. And then as you keep writing, it's like, hey, I've named this person. They can be more important. They can take on this role and that role. So right, right. You know, once you've named them, you've got to take care of them. <laughs> One of the things I found is that if you have too many named characters in a scene, during editing, you're probably going to cut one or two or five of them if there's make sure that there's a reason that you have that many characters you're interacting with. If it's just for a crowd scene purpose, maybe you don't need to show so much of this crowd scene. Only show the parts that are important for the plot, the emotional growth, and, you know, the setting. You don't have to show it all for realism. The other thing is if you have six characters sitting down discussing a situation over breakfast, don't let half of them go silent. <laughs> Unless they're the silent type that like to watch, but definitely put in a couple things about so and so gave me the side eye or what have you. Yes. So, um, DL Stewart said that he is not much of a planter. He's a heavy plotter, but does come up with new things as he's writing as well as characters. But for the most part, people are named right. Mo most people, even heavy plotters, you know realize that they haven't necessarily thought of everything in advance. Otherwise they would have already had the whole story written in advance. So um, Sam says that he tends to build archetypes and wrap descriptions around them and assign them a name right before they hit the page. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I have more time, sometimes I do, but during NaNoWriMo with the deadline, it's, it's, very tricky for me to name characters in a short period of time. 
um, MM Ward said, raise your hand if you've dropped a micro character name and then had to go back and find it later. <laughs> yep. I think we all have. <clears throat> so, um, oh, Connor joined us. Hello, uh, is loving having the stream to listen to in the background while he turned she they turned their beat sheet into scene cards awesome mm. i usually don't hit scene cards uh from the beat sheet until draft two well if they're, if they're putting the beat sheet into scrivener so they can write off of those cards yep that's the way to do it <clears throat> gotcha I'm, I'm not a scrivener user i tried it once and accidentally deleted half the tutorial and having designed web interfaces and stuff like that the fact that pcs look like they were designed in the 90s gives me heartburn um okay. and so i don't find it intuitive and i like well back in the day when I ever left this chair, I liked the fact I could use Google Docs on my phone, on my work computer, on my home computer, and it would just sync automatically, including mm -hmm. the work offline if I was going to be offline. Um, so it would download it. So uh, Charlotte wanted to chime in that they find creating names one of the easiest things, and rarely do they change a name halfway through writing. Normally they name the character and uh, fit the personality to the name. Yeah, the names are like titles. They're either easy or they're hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad at names. I really, really am. I, I struggle with them because there's so much history and so much context that automatically comes with the name. And I don't want to be tropey. I don't want... And, and I also write fantasy. I don't write modern or even historical locations. And so I typically don't have, you know, a culture that I can draw names directly from. You, so. you don't want to be accidentally tropey. You want to be deliberately tropey. Exactly. When I do a trope, it's on purpose. So Sam says a minor nondescript character from book one of my steampunk trilogy accidentally became the main character in a later book. Mm -hmm. Hashtag grow them as you need them. Um, Chandra also accidentally named a character something that was fine on paper, but could be pronounced as a slur. Ooh, yeah. You definitely want to make sure things are pronounceable both by you and someone who's never heard the name before. Um, yeah. This is why, why a second draft should be read aloud. <laughs> All right. All right. M.M. Ward says that a council of elders scene with two distinct factions creates a hard dialogue scene with 10 people arguing until the prince, who was silent the whole time, yelled at them all to shut up. Um, DL has written a few scenes with a council of 10 people, plus a few others, but they're not always all mentioned in the scene, just the main characters for that scene. So, and Lizzie joined us. Hello and welcome. Lizzie loves coming up with names. Uh, they write romance though. So just use the names they really like, mm -hmm. which is awesome, which is awesome. And I think I'm kind of cheating this, this time by going with an actual culture that has existed. So I can pick names straight from it without having to tinker well, with the names to make them feel a little less. You can also feel free to name some of your characters Steve and Janet and things like that. <laughs> I totally could. I totally could. Lizzie says uh, their Preptober is writing the beginning of the NaNoWriMo book and character development is an important part of this book. 100% important for every book. I read for the characters and the plot. Those are, and the world, wait, what don't I read for? Um, <laughs> I read for the characters and the plot. And the world building, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that visual. And by reading other people's books is when I learned that I don't know what people's eye colors are in real life, much less fake ones. Yeah, I, I don't pay attention to eye color. It's not a thing I do. Um, so. Uh, Chandra said uh, their beta reader caught the could be right as a slur name. Um. Yeah. And this is me. This is me. Sam is uh, describing, I believe, a description I've given him in the past. The number of readers who just recognize the, quote, shape of a character's name rather than committing the pronunciation to memory is staggering. Made me stop stressing about character names, which, which I totally get. I just worry about the cultural connotations. 
Um, and I have to admit, you know, uh, Steve Miller and Sharon Lee are are uh, my favorite authors, and they're they're uh, um, they're they're idols of mine in terms of of writing style. And in their Leoden novels, with some of those Leoden names, and worse when they get to the Extrang names, it's like, okay, I know who you're talking about it. I am not going to try to pronounce that name. <laughs> right, right. It it has a visual look and a mm -hmm. mental flavor in my head, and I move on. So, uh, fantasy name syndrome. Uh, right. Sam says my favorite character ever written in fiction. I'm only forty percent sure I know their actual name. Yep. Uh, Lizzie wanted to share that her character's name is L Lilia, Lily, and she's dealing with her dad being sick while being the homecoming queen and finding out who she is as a person. Very good age for coming of age, definitely. Um, M.M. Ward has an antagonist whose name is, <clears throat> but is it pronounced <laughs> Zethel or Zeth Zethel? I, I would think Zethel. Like it, it rhymes with Nathaniel, you know, eel. Yeah, Zethiel is how I'd pronounce it. Zethiel. Yeah. But M.M. Ward, as long as you can, t as long as you can tell the person recording the audiobook how to pronounce it correctly, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and Lizzie says, just remembered, I don't know what most of my characters look like. Oops. That's exactly why I'm here tonight, trying to sort that out. Um, and that's fine as long as they don't look like themselves consistently. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and Chandra didn't realize people not knowing how to pronounce names were was a thing. Uh, it's frustrating to them if they can't pronounce a name and it trips them up. Um, for DL, if they can't pronounce a name, it automatically becomes just the first three letters of the name. Um, and M.M. Ward says, once I apply the naming convention to the whole story after the zero draft, it will be spelled Zethiel. But with an X for the Z. And Lizzie loves using their simple names. Nope. Ah, fantasy versus um, uh, romance. So contemporary is easy for names, but then you have to get like the real world details right. Yeah, and the one thing that's very important is is if if you're gonna put if you're gonna put in a temporary name that you don't think you're going to keep, you make sure you spell it consistently so that you can do a find and replace on it. I was just reading one of Nathan Lowell's books where apparently he renamed a character from George to Harry in one of his drafts and missed one of the places because there are these two characters walking up, they start talking to a third character and then George steps back and says nothing. And it's like, where'd George come from? <laughs> so that's, that's a mistake anyone can make. Oh, oh, a hundred percent. So, Okay, um, I'm going to show you what I'm doing right now. So for my main character, I've got uh, Basilissa um, because I, I want to draw heavily on the myth, um, on the folktale aspect. I want it to be a folktale in space. Mm -hmm. And so um, I Googled um, uh, names that go with Basilissa. So let's make sure I'm sharing the right one. There we go. I like behind the name. I like name meanings. I like that sort of thing. Um, and I feel like it's closer to etymology and more likely to be accurate. So first we have the name. It's feminine. It's Russian. Um, in Russian, it looks like this. It's pronounced uh, Vasilisa, I think. it's. Oh, it's a form of basil. Cool. Um, there are masculine forms in the name, so you want to make sure you don't give them a masculine uh, nickname in that culture. And so people think of this name as classic, formal, maybe a little upper class, natural, wholesome, refined, strange, complex, serious, and maybe a little nerdy. Mm -hmm. So let's look at related names, which is what I'm looking for right now. So we have the equivalent name in other cultures, in Bulgarian, it's Vasilka. 
In mm-hmm. Greek, it's Vasilika. In Macedonian, it's Vasilija. Uh, in Polish, it's Waselina. Waselina. Um, there are nicknames Vaska, Kiki. Oh, Kiki comes from Vasil. Okay. Um, there are masculine forms. Oh, hey, this one doesn't have it. Okay. So I'm going to jump to. Um, uh huh. Go ahead. This is very cool because. Um, especially with your spacefaring folks, you mm-hmm. can have someone with a very Russian name who ha- is friends with someone of Greek descent and therefore mm-hmm. picks up the Greek nickname for their name. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. So that's fun. And I think if you go back to the name tab. Yes, one moment. I was on a different tab. Okay, back right. on the name tab. Go back to the name tab and scroll down. There's related names here. Right. Okay, and there's your masculine forms. Right, yes. Okay. So you want to... And other languages and cult. Okay, so it's, it's got some of the same information. Yeah, right. yeah. I thought that was what you were missing, was the masculine forms. No. Okay. I was just looking for... There are some baby name sites that'll give you names that go with a name. Mm-hmm. Um, names to go with. So... Let's see if this site has anything I like. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share a different tab. And so this this is totally part of my process. You're just sitting through it with me. And so we've got magic uh, baby names, baby names like Vasilisa. So for boy names, we've got Gleb, Alexi, Vasila, mm-hmm. Alexander, Sebastian, Nikolai, Dmitri, Yarpolk, Valerian, uh, Alyosha, Alexander, Maxim, and more. Ooh, I can do more. Um, girls' names and uh, gender neutral names. Ilya. Hmm, I might do Ilya for the uncle. Doom. <laughs> so. Um, Brilliant. That's a good one. So, okay. Um, let's see. Now I need to name her dad. I'm not naming anyone Doom. No, it's, I'm just amused that it's there. Right? So let's let's see names that go with the uncle's name and see if Arcus, Raymar, Andre, Giauz, Yakim, Nikita, Dima, Sakari, Genya. Genya. I'm thinking Genya for dad. Um, so so I'm just going to take a sheet of paper right now and write down all of the names on this page that I kind of like that I might go with for any character. Mm-hmm. So I like Arcus. I like Pavel. I like Raymar. Um, nothing else that I can pronounce that I like there. You don't like Sebastian or Nikolai? I think they're a little too overused. Dimitri's a little overused. I I love them all. Um, Mm -hmm. I I named my Kindle Sebastian, so it goes Bastion for short. Yeah. You you do definitely have a place in there where it's like, if I use this name... People will understand how to pronounce it, but it is incredibly overused. Right. Um, but if I take a slightly more obscure name, then you'll still get the the, the color and the the culture in there. Uh, um, and there's there's still a decent chance that people will be able to understand it. I'm going with Daria, Polina. I think Polina's going to be her cousin. Um, I think you're actually looking a different tab than what you're sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> we'll switch back. Because so, I'm not seeing any of those names that you're mentioning. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Let me look. Uh, I think I like Yara Polk. I would assume he'd go by Yarrow or Polk. 
Salem is a place in the States with a certain history that I don't necessarily, Julian is, is clearly a different version of Julian, which mm -hmm. I think is used a lot as like a sort of bad boy crush figure in a lot of books. It's one of the ones that I like because Julian is a well-known name. Julian is just different enough uh, 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 to, to give it a certain flavor to it. Okay. Um, but that's just me. It's, it's, right. it's your story. You can choose who you want. And you can, you can also always use it as a throwaway name of, of an engineer that you see in a dock and you never see again. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm going with Jana. I like Jana with a ZH. I'm assuming mm -hmm. that's a Z sound. Mm -hmm. um, Venora is nice. Um, I like Vera as well. Do we think Venora and Vera are two different syllable lengths and starting letters that I can get away with it? It sounds like a pair of twins. <laughs> or sisters if they're doing the same letter. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at some more boy names because I want to get at least 10 yeah. on my list and I have six. So let's see. Rostko. He sounds like a rascal. Mm. Um, Toru Rothgar I'm not going with I like Ritsu I like Antonin mm. Vlad is overdone yeah just a little uh, sadly Alexi is overdone yeah and Michael with the new spelling. Strahinja? I don't know. Which row? Second row, fifth down. Strahinja. Ah, okay. Strahinja? Something like that. Brinjar? I'm very good picking up the, the, the sound sets for different languages and very bad with remembering the vocabulary. Uh. <laughs> I once caused a uh, friends to completely fail out of rock band because of my horrid German pronunciation singing Du Hast. <laughs> so I think you already said you picked up Pavel. Pavel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fyodor. Fyodor? Fyodor. That, that sounds like a dragon's name. Um, Fourth row, third down. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like a dragon's name to me. Mm. Vegeta just so looks like somebody who's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> so I have 10 so um, okay. I, I think I can stop there pre-drag just doesn't work quite right so let's look at some more girl names so let's see I'm done with V's so no more V names for me Isolda Which I, I think is nickname of Z Zelda. Tatiana, I think, is overdone, especially in fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Celestia. Zoya sounds like an aunt or a grandmother. Yeah, that, that does sound like an older name. But I, I feel like it's, oh, straight out of American Gods. I'm skipping it because of that connotation. Oh, uh, okay. One of the, the three sisters of the um, sledgehammer guy. Gotcha. Or they were all three named Zoya. I can't remember. It's really funny when you go to look for what you think of as names in a different language and you start seeing things that you recognize and it's like, right. wait, when did this become mainstream in my <laughs> I've always liked the name Fallon. 
Like Jocelyn and Jillian. Um, right, yeah. And I have a cat climbing on top of me. Sepharina? Mm, where are we looking? Third row, uh, fifth from the bottom. Oh, okay, Sepharina. Serafina. Serafina, okay. Mm, I just okay. read two books with characters with na that name ah. popping up. And I think it's the name of a unicorn in a series. <laughs> Okay. So if if I have too strong of a connotation with that name, I'll skip it. Let's see. And I think this one two down from that looks like it's Allegria on my screen, and that's the name of a Cirque du Soleil show. Allegra. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to to skip cold meds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Allergy medication. So I didn't um, know I, that I could do Celine. cold meds. I could do Celine. I like the celestial feel to it. Yeah, well, that's why I like Celestia. It's like you're star fairing. You've got this name yeah. in your 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 background. Why not? Uh, right. And you've got simple names like Anna. Right. And Mirai. Right. But I can't pronounce Mirai very yes. well, so I'm skipping that one. Lizzie um, has noticed that I have a cat. I'm gonna um, jump back and look at the boy girl names. Um, and Charlotte has two. Okay. I like Care. Is it Carrie? Kai? How do you pronounce that? Carrie? Is that just Carrie? Hold on. Um, I don't know. I like Setsuna. Am I looking for an S or a TS? Uh, no. S. <laughs> and Windelin, I think, is a lovely name for like a navigator or something. Rhythm is a name. Oh, there's Setsuna. Okay. Yeah. Um, and somebody's going to be named Sky, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sky is his. But, but you've already said no one's going to be named Doom. No uh, going to Doom or Sasha. So, okay, I have, I need one more girl name. Kyo? Is Kyo really Russian? Um, Maybe I'll go Amu. And, no. Sometimes it's really surprising how, how names will cross borders and yeah. Blend into the language. Well, I have no girl T name, so maybe Tamaki. Toru, Tamaki. So. Yeah. Okay. So now I have a good list of 23-ish names. And that's without even starting on the vowel things for the... I, I don't know if I... I don't embarrass easily, but like sitting around trying to figure out a vowel combination that doesn't sound ridiculous involves me saying it aloud and I think Jill <laughs> might laugh at me and I would feel really silly going ah -oo, ah -oo, you, mm -hmm. for like 10 minutes. So I, I might do that part offline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's pop back into the comments for a minute. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch. That, that... Definitely. Oh, wow. Scrolling all the way up here. So... Um, Uh, Charlotte says sometimes the character just becomes one that has a complicated name. Um, and MM Ward says the real world details change so fast. Uh, DL says that I read one book and two characters had the same first three letters. And I was so confused for part of the story because I thought they were the same character. I definitely have that issue. Lizzie says, I barely rename characters, though for Lilia's name used to be Olivia. I had one named Lillian, and I changed her name to Lilivan, just to to sound slightly less British. Yeah, I, I 
After after doing my first draft of, of Perils of Prague, I had to go back through and search for variant misspellings of Harmonious just to make sure it was all spelled consistently. <laughs> oh, I, I had a last name that had three different spellings that I sorted yeah. out just before I submitted it to Pitch Wars yeah. last month. Uh, Chandra says uh, their name is typically masculine in India. So definitely I, I, people taking names from other cultures can use any way they want mm -hmm. or it, within their own culture. In the States especially, we have a big tendency of taking male names and using them for female uh, children and also taking last names like Madison and Reagan and that sort of thing, Taylor. Well, and, and so, some cultures will will use a name that's that's traditionally masculine for children of, of both genders anyway. Right. It's just that for some reason it's more popular during a certain time period for, for masculine children or feminine children. But. Right. Like Robin used to be a very male name and now it's a very female name. Mm -hmm. uh, in in this in the states, <clears throat> elsewhere, obviously different trends may may hold. Uh, DL says he's only renamed one character and that was because he had to. It was originally another char author's character, but had to change it at the last minute. Definitely. Yep. Um, one of the characters in Perils of Prague was actually generated by somebody in my gaming group and I, <laughs> I, I renamed them so I could, could, could borrow the character. Oh, lovely. Wipe the serial numbers off. Right, right. And then Ward had a character that she had her nickname before she had her name, the character's name. Definitely, I've had that happen. So has DL. Uh, Lizzie shared her other characters are, excuse me, Denver, Callan, Raylan, Brandy, Paxton, Sage, Jessa, Kendall, Isla, and Jasper. And there's more like Matt and Sarah, but they're like not really used in the book. Uh, DL knew they wanted the nickname to be Callie, but took a minute to come up with it being short for Callista. I yeah, can see uh, that. I've got a uh, um, uh, fantasy YA book where the, the main character is Casey. And that was her nickname. I knew her initials were K and C, and it took me a while uh, to figure out what her actual name was. <clears throat> my uncle's dog is named CJ, and it doesn't stand for anything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But you can get away with that a little more with dogs than girls. <laughs> so, Lizzie says that she needs to find a way for Kendall to have purpose because she hasn't written her yet, but already know it's she's going to be flat and she has ideas for everyone else. So, um, does she want to go to college? Do her parents want her to study something different than she does? Um, does she have a boyfriend that she'd rather be spending time with? Um, does she have somebody who is harassing her that she wants to avoid? Mm -hmm. um, you can always start with, you know, her, her, her goal is to not live up to other people's expectations. And during the story, she figures out what her own are. <laughs> or sibling rivalry. Maybe she mm -hmm. um, is always compared to another sibling who is amazing or vice versa. And she feels like she can't step out. There, there are a lot of ways to go. Um, so I'm not sure quite on the age range, so I might be out of line, but just, just some random thoughts off the top of my head. Uh, Charlotte says they're doing some reading right now and all of this is making them want to write. Well, you've got, you can write anytime you want, but we've got six days till NaNoWriMo kicks off. Uh, Lizzie needs some names for her Christmas and New Year's books, but don't even know what their character roles will be. And I totally understand needing to know who the characters are before fitting a name to them. Um, and then everybody squeed at uh, the cat. The cat <laughs> because cats are always welcome on my live stream. Always, always, always. Uh, Lizzie has never written fantasy, but has a mermaid trilogy idea and wants some of the mer creatures to have magic names and normal names when they're in human form. Ooh. Are the names going to be related or are they going to be totally different and like have a different language almost feel to them? Um, Lizzie says it's also a standalone idea. Uh, and then board, worship the feline overlords, give them all the pettings. Um, and Chandra definitely gets emails at work to Mr. Chandra because people um, yeah. 
see the name and make assumptions. Uh, Lizzie says my last name is a male's first name. Yes, yeah. There are definitely a lot of names that work like that. And Lizzie used to have one coach who called her Franklin and it was like I was being called a boy's name. The struggle, the struggle. Yep. Uh, M.M. Ward says for decades, naming boys after places was so popular. Interesting. So, um, Lizzie says, I've always had a thing for keeping my last name a secret, yet the teachers always yelled my last name for everyone to hear. Ugh. The struggle is real, yeah. Yeah. DL said he had permission to use their character, but we just didn't see eye to eye on a few things about the character. So I eventually just changed the name and a few details and kept rolling. Yep. That's fair. Yep. Lizzie says that Kendall is one of the best friends, but she doesn't do much. She's 17. She's black. And maybe I can make that part of her some committee. So like make her part of some committees, give her some activities. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, is she part of the after prom party committee? Cause that's always fun. Or the decorating committee. Are they doing it at the school? Like old school proms or I hear kids these days go to proms at places that aren't their gym. Who knows? Um, Lizzie says uh, for the mermaid uh, and the mer creatures, their magic names are going to be different than their human names. M.M. Ward says, Little Flower was the nickname, and the character became Daisy because some characters saw her as a flower, and the antagonist called her a weed. That's and how then, you get bad. Right? <laughs> and then they hop back in time to an era where the word for her name didn't exist, so she took the pseudonym Fleur. Yeah. Legit. Uh... Chandra says her poor brother has three first names. Oh, yep. uh, Lizzie says, I was thinking Rachel for the mermaid trilogy, but that's for her human form, not her mermaid form. So that makes me think of Rachel Bloom and her song. I was a mermaid and now I'm a rock star. I suggest you look it up. Um, Rachel can be crude. She's one of the producers and the star of the TV series, The Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I adored everything about the show except watching it because it was a train wreck. But I watched all the music videos. Uh, this is not part of the show, but it's part of the reason she got hired to do the show. Yeah. Um, I want to shout out to, to oh, I'm getting leaked here somewhere. Um, to, to Chandra about um, her, her brother with the three first names. I remember... Um, Ben Bova in his book, The Dueling Machine, had a character whose name was uh, uh, Hector. They said, is that your first name or last name? Both. And later in the story, it talked, it referred to him as, as uh, uh, Lieutenant Hector H. Hector. And it's like, were his parents just really struck by a lack of creativity? <laughs> Did they really name the child Hector, Hector, Hector? <laughs> oh, have you seen the gaming one about, I can't remember what the first name, but it was like Kevin with a C and the first name was Kevin. And then the last name was with a C. Oh, yes. And they were just messing with the car the, the GM. Yeah. The yeah. last name is with a C. <laughs> right. So DL says he's got a character where she has two different uh, first and last names. And Lizzie says, Kendall isn't on the homecoming committee. Oops, I didn't plan who was on the committee with Lily in Denver. Um, DL says, Josie Ballard and Jacal Drumright. Um, and then everybody's yeah. laughing at Hector Hector. Yep. Chandra asks, is that like Humbert Humbert? Humbert Humbert, yes. <laughs> These names are killing me. So I had super fun with my names for my middle grade story. Um, my main characters are Gom and Midney, and I just, and uh, their, their other uh, friend that they're closest with is Alum, and just like, I, I wanted ones with hard consonants and, you know, that bounced off the tongue nicely. And so mm -hmm. I just played around with sounds and literally jam on the keyboard 
and then put in spaces and see what works. And that's one way to find some really cool um, names. Uh, another way to find unique names is to take names that really exist and then change a letter or three. Yeah. Um, and that's one way to get names that feel almost natural without being familiar. So, um, Lizzie says she's always thought about characters named with the first, same first and last name, like Frederick Frederick was an idea. Um, M.M. Ward loves Ben Bova. Uh, Utopia had a character named Wilson Wilson. Lizzie, uh, a favorite name she picked out was Raina, and the girl protagonist in the last book I refer to as Rain. So, so yeah, names are super tricky. I highly recommend my have a list of names. You can either do the GL thing and have them already assigned to the people, or just have them to you know select from as you go through. And then Ward suggests Walter Walters. So uh, but, uh, let me, I'm, I'm looking for a website if you wanted to talk for a minute, Doc. Um, then one of the neat things about um, the Scrivener's uh, name generator protocol is that uh, you can determine how many names it generates. I think by default, it only generates 10 or 20 but if you're really picky, you can tell it to give you like 50 names and um, you can either have it give you a, a first and last name or all th first, middle and last. Um, and it does have different libraries of, of first and last names for different cultures. Um, actually, while you're doing that, let me sure. fire up Scrivener. We'll see who actually has something to share on screen with people first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not a Scrivener person at all. That's fine. You don't have to be, but hey, if if you've got if you've got a tool, why not use it? Right. Oh yeah, no, totally. And if you've got a cat, why not pick her up and show her to the audience? <laughs> always, always welcome <laughs> on the screen. Well, this is interesting. It's slow. And here's a cat butt. Uh. So if you want to generate characters, one website is charactergenerator.org. Another one is Hero Machine. Although some of these do require Flash and may stop working at the end of the year. Um, Where's the one I just used last week? I don't know. I can't find it. Very frustrated. Why didn't I bookmark it? What is wrong with me? You weren't thinking ahead? <laughs> Clearly. Somebody shared it on, maybe it's this. Maybe I did. Nope, nope, definitely not that one. Okay. Okay. Go away, cat. Okay. Let me let me see if I can share this screen. Sure. Never tried this before. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who can share screens. I don't know. Uh, it's giving me options. Oh, good. That's promising. I just now got to find the right app. Right. Okay. So hopefully you're seeing my screen now, or you will. There That's we go. I hit add button. screen. Can you zoom in a little? Can you make the resolution smaller so um, we can see a little better? Let's see. Because I can see stuff, but I can't read it. Well, right now, this is mostly a blank document. Um, Lizzie had to pop out. So bye, Lizzie. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. But um, let's see if I remember where this is. Um, it 
So under in Scrivener, under edit, under writing tools, I did remember where it was. <laughs> we have the name generator. So is that clear enough or do I need to adjust my resolution? Um, sure. it's, it's really small on my screen. Let me open my display preferences and is that better? Um, yes, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, so you can select gender, male, female, either. You can attempt alliteration. You can do double-barreled surnames. Uh, you can have four names, only use initials um, and set the number of initials. I want to do this just for fun. Um, if you want to set a four name starts or ends with something or contains something in it, you can which I think is a new feature in the latest version. Um, but you've got a whole different variety of, of male and female names, Catalan, Finnish, um, just generic German names. Oh, they've got Hindi and Indian names in here now. Where were you when I needed you before? Um, oh, I'm going to have some fun here. And you've got popular British names, which I already had turned on. And you just tell it how many you want to, to generate from one to 500. Wow. And boom, you've got names. Um, and I just did this with, with initials for, for giggles. So let me do it again without names. And you could just go and burn down through this to try to find something that looks like it's interesting. Um, and it's it's a great tool. And if you don't like what's on the list, you just click it again or, or change. And and you can, you can change the obscurity level. I haven't played with that before. Connor Joshua Shuttleworth. Now there's... <laughs> that's, that's pretty pretentious. Yes. Benjamin Thomas Whittingham. Yeah. All kinds of fun things here. And it's like, literally, that was how fast I was able to generate those because of the name generator. All right. Stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know a lot of people use Scrivener just because, you know, I mm -hmm. hate it. Doesn't mean everyone does. So, so yeah, one of the other things I do is I just do Google image search. Um, I try to look for models or actors because I feel uncomfortable taking profile pictures from real average people who may not know that their photos are out there. That feels very uncomfortable to me. Uh, so I'll, um, but sometimes it's better to look for fashion or singers or that sort of thing rather than actors themselves partially because of how well known so many of them are and partially you know just for variety's sake because so many of the leading actresses look the same so you could also you could also use it as a casting exercise if you're going to go go ahead and create your movie <laughs> right right so lizzie says uh someone is named william williams i think uh Chandra liked um, Walter Walters. Um, Lizzie says, oh no, it says my PC has a virus. Make sure it's not a virus uh, pop, um, up. pop up telling you and wanting you to download their software to get rid of it because that, that happens a lot. Um, DL has a friend named Disney Park. Uh, MM Ward knew someone whose name was Tree but went by Tim. I actually have a sister named Sunshine. So, I mean, I, I totally understand and I'm Morgan. So, um, DL had a teacher named May Flowers. Uh, so, oh, Tree went by time, not uh, Tim. So, 
Chandra looked at the census and deaths for the year their historical work in progress took place, which is perfect. It's exactly what I would recommend if you're doing a historical or even alternate historical um, sort of novel. Um, more shout outs for the, the kitties. Went by Tim, oh. the feline was really helping. Mm -hmm. um, I popped a couple links in for character creators. Um, Karen says on Wattpad, Cheater, Faker, Troublemaker by Jenny Rosen. That's a nice, nice title, right? Mm -hmm. So hello and welcome, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, MM Ward said, oh. <laughs> Kitty, Kitty Ann Warmer's on a snowy night. <laughs> right. So um, DL said nothing was showing on the screen. That was when I was first sharing because it was right. pretty much, I was sharing a blank document. So Yeah. Um, and MM Ward is about to lose power again. Oh no, I hope you stay warm and comfortable. Um, the wind is so bad and the lights keep dimming. Stay safe. And Lizzie says, I don't have any viruses, it lied. It usually does. I, I trying don't. to trick you. Right? Yeah. So, okay. Um, I'm. So I also threw in the chat mm -hmm. the link for this person does not exist. Uh. Which is the website that gives you the 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 generated photos the photorealistic generated photos and it's like every time you load it it gives you a different picture um, right yeah i don't know why that didn't appear in the in the chat well it, it appeared in the chat but not in this version of the chat but huh weird i don't know anyway but it's there i can see it um <laughs> But uh, like I said, if, if you just need random images to figure out what somebody looks like, you can keep reloading that and, and save off images that you like. Um, Indeed. It's, it's, it's not a great tool for, uh, um, for trying to find the look for a character that you've almost got imagined in your mind's eye. But if you just need, I need a face in the crowd that I need to describe, it's a great tool. <laughs> Right, right, definitely, definitely. So, um, okay, is there anything else we want to talk about about character creation? We've talked about names, we've talked about how to decide what they look like, we've talked mm -hmm. about making sure that the cultural um, background and baggage is what you intend and what you yeah. expect. Um, we've talked about ways to come up with faces and looks and you can always, you know, pin three different people and say that face, that body, and <laughs> that skin tone or what have you, you mm -hmm. know, um, whatever works for you. Yep. Um, so those, those are my, my three main things that I do when I'm creating and I've got my lovely list of names. So mm -hmm. I am set and ready to, to go with that. And the, the thing that I always come back to when, when looking at building characters is, uh, why are why are we interested in this character? Yeah. Uh, is there something about this person that is that is special? Um, and and the answer could be no. You know, it could be this is just a normal person that has extraordinary things happen to to them, and the story I want to tell is how normal people react to extraordinary things. Um, but if you have if you have in your head why this person is important, why this person is interesting, then you can put that into your writing more easily and you won't have to have people come back and say, why should I care about this character? And the answer is you shouldn't care about this character. You should be going out doing your job in the world, but <laughs> you're here reading for fun. So enjoy the damn episode. <laughs> oh, oh. I hate that question. Uh, why should I care about this character? Why should you care about any character? Because they go on fun adventures and things happen. Yeah. And they live through it because they're persistent. Yeah. So, you know, persistence matters. So uh, we, for, for those who dropped in late, uh, we talked about ways to try to avoid stereotypical characters. When you think of like a coffee barista or a policeman, there are certain attributes that are probably gonna come to mind. And one way to stop 
or prevent yourself from having a character that seems stereotypical is to come up with a list of adjectives. Um, and I've done this before. It's based on a workshop by Joe Walton in which she had us write three um, attributes of a character and we dropped them in a hat and then we chose three different ones. And then you try to visualize what sort of character and what sort of world this character might live in. And it helps um, avoid uh, default characters and really flesh them out and make sure they have personalities. And one way to do this by yourself is just make a huge list of adjectives for characters that don't necessarily all jive. And then roll a dice and pick three uh, numbers at random and see if you can put if that would fit your character. Yeah. It's your story. If it doesn't work, throw it away, keep going. Yeah. And there, there actually are a lot of role playing game systems that have quirks and flaws that you can you can borrow it from that system oh, yeah. and use it to flesh out your characters. Use whatever tools you have at hand. <laughs> so so definitely, especially if they're on this on screen for more than one scene, it's best to make sure that they're fully wrapped three-dimensional characters. That's one way to avoid dealing with um cardboard cutouts. Cardboard cutouts or cultural appropriation. You want to yeah. have a variety of characters from each culture and not just people from this culture are X or Y. Mm -hmm. By having a variety of characters from different worlds and different different backgrounds and different cultures, you can have a diverse world without falling into stereotypes or one-itis. Mm -hmm. So, hello, Spence. We're just wrapping up, but you can always watch it in replay. But we're glad you came out anyway. Definitely, definitely. So let's go ahead and give our outros, unless you had anything else to add. I know I've been talking a lot. Um, I just I just wanted to say, did, did we want to ask the audience if they had any other questions? Oh, or Are there any things that you get stuck with world building? Are there anything... Any tips or tricks that you found that really help you uh, move forward? Let us know. Let us know. Yep. So um, DL says he uses D&D &D attributes with some of my characters and their interactions with others. So yeah, a lot of us um, who come into writing are coming from role-playing backgrounds um, because story building appeals to us. Uh, Lizzie liked the loves the naming thing so yay i'm glad my t trick helps um spence goes curses oh well y'all have been up in the background getting more watch time ah, so uh i i hope the baking went well today let's see any more comments or questions i don't want to rush anybody looks like lizzie's saying good night <laughs> Right, right. I saw that. So, okay. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And next week, I'm going to be back at my normal 4.30 p.m. Eastern, wait, Eastern Standard Time. No no more daylight. Remember the time change next Sunday um, if you're in the States or places that follow uh, daylight saving time. Um, and I will be at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time um, with my first live stream NaNoWriMo sprint for the year. So we're almost there. Yep. This time next week will be NaNoWriMo. So yeah. thank you all for coming. Go ahead and give your outro, Doc. All right. I am Doc Coleman, steampunk author and author of The Perils of Prague. You can find uh, this and all of my other works on Amazon uh, by searching for Doc Coleman. You can find me at DocColeman.com and at SwimmingCatStudios.com. Um, it's been my pleasure to jump in here and, and help out uh, at the last minute. And <laughs> have a good one. Get ready. Go right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Morgan Hazelwood. I am an unpublished fantasy writer with an addiction to hitting all of the writing panels at every writing convention and then blogging about them and vlogging about them and podcasting about them. I have a problem. We all know this. 
And I now do live streams on Sunday evenings where you can write, you can craft, you can just hang out. No obligation to actually be productive. Uh, so thank you all for coming. You can find me at morganhazelwood.com, morganhazelwood.fireside.fm, YouTube slash Morgan Hazelwood. <laughs> Sensing a trend here. On Twitter, I am Morgan Hazelwood because somebody is camping on my name. Oh. Um, but yeah, Morgan Hazelwood everywhere. And looking forward to seeing y'all again next week. Have fun. And I hope the writing goes well. Bye-bye.